This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Sponsored by Amazon, Audible, HostGator, Gamefly, and supporters of independent media like you. Welcome to the Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 43rd episode of the podcast. I don't have any new Patreon patrons or members to thank today, but if you go to humanistreport.com support, you can see the names of all of the individuals who make this podcast possible, and it is your contributions that fund this show, that help improve the show. All of you guys are the ones who funded this microphone, so thank you all so much for making this possible. On today's episode, I've got a lot of topics to go over. So first of all, I'm a little bit late to the party, but I will be talking about how Bernie Sanders supporters have been vilified by the Democratic establishment after they rigged the convention in Nevada uh, in favor of Hillary Clinton, but now they're the ones who are being blamed, that is, Bernie Sanders supporters. So I'm going to get to that. Also, the DNC chair, Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman, and Schultz decided to blast Bernie Sanders, but thankfully he hit back. Now, the Democratic establishment also held a closed-door meeting on how to, quote, handle Bernie Sanders and his supporters, so I will discuss that. And additionally, Hillary Clinton put her arrogance on full display in a new interview with CNN, so of course I have to cover that. Also, I will debunk an attack piece on Bernie Sanders supporters from Time Magazine, who tries to perpetuate the Bernie bro myth and additionally calls grow for President Obama to remove the DNC chair. And last but not least, Nina Turner, a Bernie Sanders surrogate, gave the DNC chair a reality check and let her know that if she does not try to court over Bernie Sanders supporters, if she does not stop vilifying Bernie Sanders supporters, it's going to be bad news for the Democratic Party come November. So all of these topics and more will be discussed. I apologize for not getting to the Nevada Democratic Convention sooner. There was a lot of chaos that broke out the day after I finished filming last week's episode, and I've been extremely busy with school. I'm approaching finals. I have so many exams to grade lately, uh, and I just didn't unfortunately have time to get to that. But since that's late, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and get to that story first. So hopefully you guys will find it informative and we'll kind of summarize it for you if you haven't uh, already heard about the story. So as you all know by now, all hell broke loose at last Saturday's Nevada Democratic Convention. Lots of shenanigans went on. Effectively, the process was rigged to benefit Hillary Clinton. Uh, and there are many examples as to why this is the case. So first and foremost, more than 50 Bernie Sanders delegates were just denied delegate status for arbitrary reasons. Uh, another example is they held vocal votes. Uh, and regardless of what people chose... The DNC chair in Nevada, Roberta Lang, unilaterally decided to implement the rules of her choice. And when Bernie Sanders supporters were really aggravated at this and were yelling and whatnot, well, they brought in armed guards to get them to settle down and whatnot. Because who would have thought that they would be frustrated with the rules, right? So anyways, to give you guys an example of just part of the shenanigans that went on, so here's a video of them doing a vocal vote for yay or nay, and clearly the nays have it. But Roberta Lang, she told everyone that her ruling was not debatable and cannot be challenged. Take a look. Now, to make matters even worse, after this happened, Senator Barbara Boxer came in from California, and she was really condescending to Bernie Sanders supporters, and she began to antagonize them. Take a look. Now, when you boo me, you're booing Bernie Sanders. Go ahead. You're booing Bernie Sanders. Let's hear it for Hillary Clinton. All right. We have the vote. We have the voice. We have victory. Go ahead. Yeah. And now after that, she continued to be antagonistic because as she was leaving, she was blowing kisses to the crowd in a really sarcastic, condescending way. And then after that, she went on MSNBC and talked about how she was so afraid for her life when she was sitting there antagonizing the crowd. 
did fear for my safety, and I fortunately had a lot of security around me. And so this is what our democracy has come to. Now look, I'm only giving you a small snapshot as to what happened. I'll put full stories to what happened in the description box, but what I actually want to talk about is the aftermath. Because effectively what we saw was that the process was rigged in favor of Hillary Clinton. This isn't the first time this happened this election cycle. The Democratic establishment has overwhelmingly been in the tank for Hillary Clinton since the beginning. We've seen this time and again with DNC Chair Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz. And now we see it with Roberta Do Anything for Hillary Lang. So... It's really frustrating that they have the gall to do this and then get angry and bring in armed guards when people get upset that they're rigging the process in front of their very eyes and don't like it when they are antagonized. But the shenanigans that ensued after this may be more outrageous than what happened at the convention. So is it the case that the Democratic establishment are sorry and are being apologetic for what they did at the convention? Well, they're actually blaming Bernie Sanders supporters and are claiming that they were violent at the convention. Uh, and also, they're focusing on what Bernie Sanders supporters did to the DNC chair afterwards. So, the official complaint that the Nevada State Democratic Party filed to the DNC after they rigged the convention is as follows. We write to alert you to what we perceive as the Sanders campaign's penchant for extra-parliamentary behavior. Indeed, actual violence in place of democratic conduct in a convention setting. And furthermore, what we can only describe as their encouragement of and complicity in a very dangerous atmosphere that ended in chaos and physical threats to fellow Democrats. Indeed, the threats to the chair of the Nevada State Democratic Party are ongoing at time of this writing as Sanders activists have posted her cell phone and home address online and have bombarded her with threats to her life and the safety of her family, the situation had reached a point where public safety could no longer be assured and that the proceedings had to be concluded in very short order, hence the reason why they decided to bring in armed guards. Now I'll put the rest of the complaint also in the description box, uh, and essentially what they're saying is that Bernie Sanders supporters are violent, they were being violent, they resorted to violence, uh, they claimed that there were chairs that were thrown and whatnot, uh, and they're just overwhelmingly focusing on Bernie Sanders supporters, they're not taking into account the fact that they rigged the process and that they caused some of this outrage. Not at all. So now the media, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is claiming that chairs were thrown, for example, that's one of the acts of violence that went on, but unfortunately for them, there is zero evidence of this. There is one video of a guy picking up a chair, but he puts it back down and then he hugs someone. Uh, so that's bogus, and even Snopes debunked this. It's fake, but yet the DNC chair as well as the Nevada State Democratic Party keep perpetuating this myth because they want Bernie Sanders supporters to look bad. They want them to look violent. They want you to look away at what they did and focus on what Bernie Sanders supporters did. Now, of course, the media is having a field day with this. Here's a taste of what they've been saying. People wave signs, but, they boo, they yell. Chair is being flipped, no, first of all, show me, no, show me one. Saying that show she's me, being threatened. Wh hold on, let, let, let's separate the two things. Since Barbara Boxer politi said she feared for her life. Shouting, it's not nothing. You can't Wait a tell minute. Barbara Boxer that she, when Barbara Boxer, it, who is a lioness in the Senate, uh, says she feels threatened, that's okay? So, no. Uh, Sally, I'm going to begin you. with you because I know that you've been an, an avid Bernie Sanders supporter since the beginning, but we've now got a grandmother who is worried about her five-year-old grandchild. Uh, we've got a woman who says her marriage might be on the brink because of Bernie Sanders supporters. We have a U.S. senator who just said on live national television that she feared for her life at a Democratic convention. Where is this going, Sally? Well, okay, first, let me let me just say one thing I think it's important to say, which is I know we in the media often love sort of drama and false equivalencies, and in, in no way, shape, or form is this akin to what's happening in the Republican Party. There you have leading Answer figures. Answer the question. I don't want to talk about the okay, Republicans. No, I want to I say, want, I'm going to the Republicans in about 10 minutes, but I right, need 10 full I minutes to get down Democrats on this I mess. It is ugly. It is Okay, wait, wait, wait. Someone All who is I... fearing for her life. Yes. Where is this going? Now, there is evidence that someone did dox DNC Chair Nevada, Roberta Lang's information, her home address, her cell phone, and she has received really threatening voicemails and really odd text messages. Here's some examples. So someone texted her and said, hey, bitch, we know where you live, where you work, where your kids eat, where your kids go to school and grandkids. And another person called her the biggest cunt in politics next to Clinton. And she was also texted pictures of a guillotine. This is really just troubling. And it goes without saying, I wholeheartedly condemn violence. I never, 
ever condone violence. I'm in favor of nonviolent protest. I'm in favor of actually using constructive means to accomplish political objectives. So if you are someone who did participate in this, then you're being counterproductive. This is wrong. Please don't do this. You don't have to do this. We can win on the merit of our argument. So the wrongness of what they did and the harassment that she's received is immoral. But that doesn't mean that she's not also guilty for doing what she did at the Nevada State Convention. Now, here's the thing about this. If you are receiving all these death threats and whatnot, please do not post them online. Report them to the Nevada police. And I'm guessing what they would instruct you to do is to stay inside your house. Uh, don't send them online because when you publicize this, then you make matters worse. And furthermore, part of me wants to pull out my tinfoil hat and question the validity of this based on her actions. Because if you're really afraid for your life, and look, I'm not going to say challenge her, but if you are, then you don't want to publicize this. You, you want to make sure that you stay out of the spotlight for a few days. You want to report everything that you see to the police. But if she's releasing them online, then there's evidence that she didn't report them to the police because they probably wouldn't allow her to release this. And furthermore, we know about how David Brock is paying $1 million for Clinton trolls to uh, correct the record on Bernie Sanders. So who knows if this is something orchestrated by them. But regardless if this is true or false, again, let me just state that I never condone violence. I'm a humanist. I believe that even these threats, if they're baseless, just the psychological impact that they have, it's wrong. And you should never do it. Okay, you can try to challenge Roberta Lang's legitimacy through legal means. You can try to challenge her and sign petitions and get her to step down. But if you send her threats, then that's just wrong. And I wholeheartedly condemn violence, as does Bernie Sanders. In fact, he stated, I condemned any and all forms of violence, including the personal harassment of individuals. Now, in spite of this condemnation, Roberta Lang is still demanding an apology from Bernie Sanders. Take a look. Not only were people talking when we were trying to run the convention and yelling and rushing the stage and throwing chairs and um, yelling for my death in the crowd, those are the kinds of things that have to be stopped in. Uh, what should you know, he say? How I've can he stop that? I have not received an apology. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I have not received anything from the Sanders campaign. I haven't seen anything that said that this should stop. So it's clear, Roberta Lang is against violence, as she should be, as any rational human being should be. Uh, but when asked about whether or not she had anything to say about the violence that Bernie Sanders' campaign had dealt with, so for example, there were gunshots fired into his campaign office, in Nevada, and some of his staffers' uh, houses were ransacked, uh, she had nothing to say about this. She didn't know what to say. Um, you are the state Democratic chairwoman, and if this happened at a campaign headquarters in your state, I would assume that there would be some uh, curiosity or concern enough to at least have someone in the office call. Well, you know, look, um, it happened at 10 o'clock last night. It's Our office isn't open yet. I haven't had any opportunity to um, take any steps forward. Look, I am concerned. I am concerned not only for my safety and what has happened to me, but for the safety of everyone involved. So here's the thing about responsibility. Is it the case that Bernie Sanders is responsible for condemning the actions of his supporters? Absolutely. Has he done that? Yes, he has. Does he need to apologize for the actions of his supporters? No, because his movement is very broad. He can't control the actions of his supporters. And if you claim that he does owe Roberta Lang an apology for actions that he can't control, well then, you're being incredibly unreasonable. Let me tell you why. So if that were the case, if Bernie Sanders is supposed to apologize to Roberta Lang for the actions of his supporters, I want an apology from Hillary Clinton because I've been tweeted to, I've been called homophobic slurs, is Hillary Clinton going to apologize to me? I also would like an apology from Donald Trump because one of his supporters told me that I should be deported to Mexico. I'm not Mexican, <laughs> so you can't deport me to Mexico. But I mean, nonetheless, it's xenophobic, right? I'd like an apology. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you're going to demand an apology from a candidate for the actions of their supporters, then they're not going to have much time to campaign because they're going to be here all day because every single candidate has a proportion of their supporters that are just immoral, that are assholes. Okay, and Bernie Sanders is no different. But what counts is that he condemned the violence. That's what you have to do. You can't encourage it like Donald Trump, where he said, I'll give you money or I'll pay your legal fees, fees if you punch that guy. That's wrong. Bernie Sanders didn't do that. He took responsibility for the actions of his supporters and condemned any violence and harassment. I don't know what more you want. It just 
proves evidence of the fact that you may be using this as an opportunity to further vilify Bernie Sanders. Just like you're the victim of online harassment, Roberta, Bernie Sanders supporters are also victims. They're victims of a political system that favors the billionaire class. They're victims of political violence against them. We're victims of an oligarchic state where only special interests get to dictate policy outcomes and our voices have a statistically non-significant impact on policy. That's from a study from Princeton University by Dr. Gillens and Page that found that only the business class, only the billionaire class, actually have a say when it comes to policies that are passed. That's wrong. The political system victimizes people every single day. So what you did, Roberta Lang, is further perpetuate the victimization of the working poor class. You made our, quote, democratic process even more undemocratic than it already is, just so that way you can help Hillary Clinton get a couple extra delegates so that way she can get in office and do the bidding of her rich billionaire donors. That's wrong. You're guilty too. Take responsibility for it. Now, I'm not saying that you deserve to be threatened for what you did. Nobody deserves that. Nobody deserves to have their information doxxed and to be threatened and to have their family threatened, okay? That's wrong. That's immoral. I condemn that. But you're also guilty. You cheated. You are a cheater. You cheated for Hillary Clinton when you didn't even have to. She could technically lose all the remaining states left by a certain margin and still become the nominee. Why? Why would you do that? And furthermore, actions have consequences. You can't rig the democratic process under the nose of Bernie Sanders supporters and not expect them to be angry and outraged. You see, they've proven that they are a very mobilized group of people. They will phone bank for Bernie Sanders. They will donate to him. They'll come together to attack injustice that they see. And that manifested itself in a very bad and unproductive way this time, unfortunately. But what you did was wrong. So yes, it's the case that violence is wrong, and I don't condone that. Again, I'll say it. I condemn violence and harassment. But that doesn't negate from the fact that what you did is also wrong. So Bernie Sanders did his part. He took responsibility for their actions. He condemned the violence. Now it's time for you to take responsibility for your actions. It's time for you to step down from your position as DNC chair in Nevada. You also need to realize that what you did was wrong. So after chaos broke out at the Nevada Democratic Convention last Saturday, Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chair, went on a media speaking spree. And rather than trying to unite the party, she decided to take a side and blame Bernie Sanders. So here's what she said on MSNBC. The Democratic National Committee are, is neutral when it comes to this primary. That having been said, the reports that I heard from this weekend's Nevada Democratic Convention were seriously disturbing. And I did listen to that young Sanders supporter just now. And the process that she talked about, perfectly reasonable, understandable, that it may have resulted in some frustration, although, frankly, the credentials committee in the, in the Nevada process was evenly split between Sanders representatives and Clinton representatives. But be that as it may, the, the proper response to frustration over process is never violence and intimidation. So if they were frustrated over the way the process unfolded, there is an appropriate civil and orderly way to address that. But throwing chairs and engaging in violence and threats, uh, graffitiing the Nevada State Party headquarters with threats as well is absolutely unacceptable and should be condemned by Senator Sanders directly and unequivocally. And his supporters should make sure that they take steps to not allow this to happen anywhere in the country again. But the fact that the Sanders campaign has issued a but in between condemnation of violence and frustration over the process seems to excuse their supporters' actions, which is unacceptable. So my favorite part about that is she said, quote, the DNC is neutral when it comes to this primary. The Democratic National Committee is neutral when it comes to this primary. She said that with a straight face, mind you. She said the Democratic uh, National Committee is neutral. Oh, Debbie, you <laughs> you lack self-awareness on so many different levels. Uh, also, she claimed that chairs were thrown, which is a lie. There's a video of someone picking up a chair, but he put it back down and he hugged it out with someone. So that's a lie, and she said it multiple times. Also, she said the fact that Bernie Sanders issued a butt after, the, after his condemnation of violence seems to excuse the violence. 
Oh, really? So you're really trying to make Bernie Sanders appear as though he condones violence or that he excuses it? He said, I condemn the violence and harassment. What more do you want from him? Maybe it's the case that matters aren't always black and white. Yes, he condemned the violence, but it is the case that the world is nuanced. There's also the fact that the Democratic Party in Nevada was also guilty. They rigged the system. You see, they committed political violence. That's also unacceptable and detestable. Are you speaking out against that? Absolutely not. You claim the process is fair when we have video evidence of them taking a vocal vote and the nays had it, but yet the party chair, Roberta Lang in Nevada, said, actually, you know what? You can't debate me. You can't challenge me. I say yay. That's not okay. Actions have consequences. And you see, the fact that the Nevada Democratic Party rigged the process of the Nevada Democratic Convention specifically to disenfranchise Bernie Sanders supporters, well, Debbie Do Anything for Hillary doesn't care about that because she's d done the same exact thing on a national level. So she probably sees what Roberta Lang is doing and she's applauding her, saying, oh yes, please continue to rig it for Hillary even though we don't actually need to, but let's just do it anyway to piss off Bernie Sanders supporters because I hate them so much. It's unacceptable. The amount of contempt that she holds for us is really unnerving from someone who is the head of one of two major parties in the United States. So she also went on CNN and she denied that the process was unfair, even though we have video footage that it was wholly unfair. So take a look at what she had to say. However legitimate you think your, your concern is, that you respond to that concern with, with civility, and with in an orderly way the Sanders and camp. that in none excuse me and that in no way is it ever acceptable to condone or to even or, or to ignore violence and intimidation against officials who, with whom you're frustrated the sanders campaign uh says and also said here on new day uh they don't obviously condone any type of violence or threatening behavior that that was wrong uh they say the senator himself said the same thing uh, and that they don't understand why you said that his response was unacceptable. They say what's unacceptable is having Harry Reid call them, and they say basically tell them to settle down, that it was an intimidating tactic. Well, when you, <laughs> you know, with all due respect, when there is a but in between condemnation of violence generally and after the word but, you go on to seemingly justify the, the reason that, that, that the violence and intimidation has occurred, then that falls short of, of making sure that going forward, this kind of conduct that doesn't occur How in they the respond future. So in case you didn't notice, she really loves that talking point about there being a but after condemning violence. Back Has issued a, is a but, but in between, between condemnation of violence. violence. So to summarize what she's saying, Bernie Sanders and his supporters are wrong. Bernie Sanders and his supporters have a penchant for violence uh, and nothing the DNC or the Democratic Party establishment ever does is wrong. But please come and vote for us in November when Hillary Clinton is inevitably the nominee, please. This is ridiculous. I can't believe that she would expect us to remain in the party. Sorry, but July 29th, National Dump Dems Day. I'm switching to an independent. I'm not going to be part of a party that rigs the process that is wholly undemocratic. Now, Bernie Sanders' campaign heard what the DNC chair said and fired back saying this. I mean, it's been pretty clear, Steve, from almost from the get-go uh, that she has been uh, working against Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's no doubt about it, uh, you know, for personal reasons. You know, whether it's that debate schedule that we had, that very confined debate schedule uh, that we had with debates scheduled on weekends where no one was going to be watching, uh, whether it was... Uh, uh, this joint fundraising agreement that they have with the Hillary Clinton campaign, which is taking money out of state parties, uh, you know, whether it's this, uh, the standing committees where they've appointed uh, host, I mean, really hostile uh, Hillary Clinton partisans against, uh, you know, uh, to head these committees at the convention. I mean, Debbie Wasserman Schultz has really been a divider uh, and not really provided the kind of leadership uh, that the Democratic Party needs. What, what, for, for personal reasons, what you say she's doing this for personal reasons, what do you mean? Well, I just think if you talk to, to other high-ranking Democrats on the Democratic National Committee, which I do uh, with some uh, frequency, uh, I would say that there is not unanimity in terms of her tactics and her responses throughout this campaign. I mean, if you think back to that issue where they uh, shut off the Senator Sanders' access to his data shortly before the uh, the Iowa uh, caucuses, I mean, that was a unilateral action taken on her so, part. Uh, Believe she, me, there was tr tremendous pressure inside the party structure for her to relent. So you, you think she's greasing the skids for Hillary Clinton? 
No, I don't, I don't really know what her motivation is, but it's cl been clear there's a pattern of conduct uh, from the beginning of this campaign uh, that has been uh, hostile to Bernie Sanders and his supporters, and really, uh, you know, she's really become a divisive uh, figure in the party. Okay, let me ask you this. If the process has been unfair, if you have not gotten a fair shake in this process, can you, if Hillary Clinton does win the nomination, if Hillary Clinton's the Democratic nominee, can you unite behind her, somebody who won what you believe is a rigged process? Well, don't, let's, let's not confuse the, what Debbie Wasserman Schultz has done with some kind of broad-based indictment of the process. I mean, there clearly are uh, process issues, I think, that have to be resolved going forward to make the party more inclusive and open. Uh, but do I think the party is going to come together to defeat Donald Trump? 100 percent. So I like the fact that he said what should have been said a long time ago by Bernie Sanders' campaign, that she's divisive. She's dividing Democratic voters. She's consistently been tipping the scale in favor of Hillary Clinton since the beginning. Finally, what took you so long? I like that he said that. That was a strong response, but there were two areas where I actually was not impressed with Jeff Weaver's response. Uh, so particularly, he was asked the question, when you say Debbie doing this for personal reasons, what do you mean? Uh, and he didn't bring up the direct conflict of interest. Debbie do anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz, who is now the DNC chair, who's supposed to remain neutral, ran Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2008. Isn't that a direct conflict of interest? And seeing that the DNC has to remain neutral, shouldn't she have stepped down from her position seeing that Hillary Clinton is running for president? Why hasn't this been brought up? Why didn't you mention that, Jeff? It, it's so frustrating. Because if the DNC chair is supposed to remain neutral under their party rules, then she's violating the rules of her own party that she's supposed to be leading. What would have been right is if she stepped down. That's what would have been right. Now, also, uh, he was asked, did he or did he not get a fair shake? The answer is simple. No, he did not get a fair shake. Jeff didn't say that either. So not only was there brazen election fraud and vote purging in states such as Arizona, New York, Nevada, but the entire corporate media establishment has been doing propaganda for Hillary Clinton since she announced her candidacy. To give you an example, The Intercept discovered that paid Hillary Clinton operatives who are lobbyists and who are on the Clinton payroll, people who are supposed to be disclosing this conflict of interest, they've gone on the mainstream media and have pretended to be neutral Democratic strategists. That's not okay. They're doing propaganda for Hillary Clinton when they have a conflict of interest that's not being disclosed. And furthermore, Hillary Clinton used her big media platform to slander Bernie Sanders and his supporters. She alleged that Bernie Sanders is sexist, alleged that Bernie Sanders is racist. And yet, in spite of all of this, you expect us to say that the process is fair? Of course the process isn't fair. And what's frustrating to me is that the DNC has done any and everything possible to help Hillary Clinton get ahead in this election, yet all that this pundit is worried about is whether or not Bernie Sanders will support Hillary Clinton. He said, oh, uh, hey, Jeff, uh, when Bernie inevitably loses, uh, he's going to tell supporters to get behind Hillary Clinton, right? Right? Is that what he's going to do? Well, here's the thing. As a Bernie Sanders supporter, I think I could speak to this. So if you would have asked me this last year, if I would have supported Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders, well, before I witnessed the election fraud, before I witnessed the media propaganda, before Hillary Clinton decided to slander not just Bernie Sanders, but his supporters, before David Brock said that Bernie Sanders doesn't care about black people, before we were called violent by the media, before Bill Clinton called us sexist, before Hillary Clinton told us that we don't do our research and we believe Bernie Sanders lies, maybe I would have said, I might vote for Hillary Clinton. But after seeing all of this, do you want to know what my response is when I'm told to fall in line and support Hillary Clinton by the media, by Hillary Clinton, or by the Democratic Party establishment? This is my response. No thank you. Democratic Party leaders are growing increasingly worried that Bernie Sanders will actually threaten their electoral prospects come November because Bernie Sanders is something really unique in politics. He's not taking money from the billionaire class. And since his supporters have seen that we actually can have a candidate that isn't corrupt, 
Well, now they're not really inclined to support these corporatist Democrats that they always put forth. So seeing that now Bernie Sanders and his movement is a growing threat to the Democratic establishment, they decided to hold a closed door meeting to figure out how to, quote, handle Bernie Sanders and his supporters. So The Hill explains that Democrats in the room decided the best course would be to let Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid handle the delicate task of talking to Sanders about the increasingly negative tone of supporters of his presidential bid, according to sources familiar with what happened at the meeting. A senior Democratic aide said that thinking reflects an acknowledgement among the senators that Reid is the one member of the caucus who has an actual relationship with him. Now, additionally, the reason why other Democratic senators thought that Harry Reid would be the best person to talk to Sanders is because both have a strong independent streak. Reid is allergic to Washington's social circuit of receptions and dinners that draw many members of Congress. He's never been a creature of D.C., the aide said. I can't remember a single reception or dinner that he's been to. Sanders is also something of a loner who shows little interest in hanging out with lobbyists. How out of touch are they? So because Harry Reid doesn't like to go to these receptions with lobbyists, that somehow makes him anti-establishment or an independent? Okay, let me just clarify in case this is unclear. Harry Reid is very much a part of the Democratic establishment. Comcast is one of his biggest donors. He's taken more than $150,000 from the pharmaceutical industry who has a vested interest in preventing single-payer healthcare from coming to fruition. Let's not get it twisted. Harry Reid is establishment. He's not an independent. He doesn't have an independent streak in him. He is towing the party line. So Harry Reid actually left this meeting early to call Bernie Sanders, and I don't know what the details were, but I would presume that it was something like, hey, Bernie, buddy, pal, Look, we're all getting a little bit worried that your supporters are seeing what a real non-corrupt politician looks like, and you're making us look bad. So, I mean, can you tone it down? I mean, we've tried to vilify your supporters and make them look bad in the media, but they're not stopping. So, please, can you just be as corrupt as us, maybe? Or just toe the party line more? Or maybe just drop out, preferably, so that way we can all unite behind Hillary? So, now, Bernie Sanders did not take kindly to Harry Reid's finger-wagging, and he decided to give him the middle finger, and he released this statement in defiance. It is imperative that the Democratic leadership, both nationally and in the states, understand that the political world is changing and that millions of Americans are outraged at establishment politics and establishment economics. The Democratic Party has a choice. It can open its doors and welcome into the party people who are prepared to fight for real economic and social change, people who are willing to take on Wall Street, corporate greed, and a fossil fuel industry which is destroying the planet, or... The party can choose to maintain its status quo structure, remain dependent on big money campaign contributions, and be a party with limited participation and limited energy. If the Democratic Party is to be successful in November, it is imperative that all state parties treat our campaign supporters with fairness and the respect that they have earned. Unfortunately, that was not the case at the Nevada convention. At that convention, the Democratic leadership used its power to prevent a fair and transparent process from taking place. So now, the Democratic establishment did not like this response from Bernie Sanders, because how dare he stand up for his supporters and demand that we actually earn the respect for supporting the party, for caucusing with the party, in spite of the fact that the party has betrayed us, has given us the middle finger. So, yeah, I think that he's right, and he should demand that we actually get the respect that we've earned. But they didn't like this, so The Hill reports that Reed said he was very surprised by the defiant response and dismissed it as a silly stunt put together by campaign staff and not representative of Sanders' views. Now, additionally, conservative pro-NSA Democrat Dianne Feinstein had this to say, Reid is the Democratic leader of the Senate, and Senator Sanders is a member of the Democratic caucus. He's not a Democrat. He's an independent. Well, he's really a socialist, but he's a member of our caucus, and as such, he should listen. And Joe Manchin said, Bernie's not a Democrat. What are we worried about? Why would Bernie want to play nice? I'm just saying, if a person doesn't even want to conform to be Democratic, it's kind of hard to say, okay, all of a sudden, you have to do all these things. So when they say that, you know, he's not really a Democrat, he's not one of us, they don't realize that they're making themselves look bad. Voters like Bernie Sanders, voters flock to Bernie Sanders because he's not a part of the corrupt Democratic establishment. The reason why Bernie Sanders is not a Democrat, he stated, is because they're too far to the right. They often succumb to the interests of big business and billionaires. So by saying that, you're saying that 
Bernie Sanders doesn't want to play ball because you're all too corrupt. So inadvertently, you're admitting that you're corrupt. That's why we don't like you and you don't get it. You can't get it through your thick skulls that we don't give a shit about party labels. I don't care if Bernie Sanders isn't a Democrat. Bernie Sanders can literally form a party with Vermin Supreme who wants to give everyone a free pony in the country. And... I wouldn't give a shit. I don't care about the party. I care about the policies. You see, what's not gonna get us fed when we're hungry is party loyalty. What's also not gonna raise our wages is party loyalty. If you want us to be loyal, then what you have to do is cultivate that loyalty. I don't care about party loyalty. You're not helping yourself when you make this case. And rather than embracing Bernie Sanders and taking his campaign as an example as what a true Democrat should be because he's really getting to the roots of the Democratic Party. He's a pro-FDR, pro-Jimmy Carter Democrat. Well, rather than doing that, they're telling us that they don't want our votes. Debbie Do Anything for Hillary has done this. Hillary Clinton has done this herself. Well, you know what? Ask and you shall receive, but be careful what you wish for because come November, you won't get our votes. After months of bias against Bernie Sanders and contempt for his supporters by the DNC chair, calls for Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz to resign have now grown louder. So first of all, Mika Brzezinski of MSNBC called for her to step down. Can I ask why does. would you own that. why would Bernie Sanders politely get in line for the Democratic Party? Because Hillary Clinton. I sure as hell that. I sure as hell wouldn't if a, if the party I was a member of treated me like this, rigged the she debate process, down. rigged Iowa, rigged the entire thing going down. forward. If if the Democratic Party, if, if the Republican Party, did, I'd say go straight to hell, I'm running as an independent. Now, second of all, CNN actually published an op-ed which called for Obama to remove her. So they state, the President of the United States has a phone call to make. He needs to call Debbie Wasserman Schultz and request that for the good of the Democratic Party unity, and to best Donald Trump in November, she step aside. As an individual, Wasserman Schultz has every right to support a candidate. However, the position of the Democratic National Committee chair requires resolute neutrality, both in perception and in practice. Yet, at major milestones in the primary race, Wasserman Schultz's actions have been anything but neutral, to the extreme detriment of the party. Now, he goes on to list reasons as to why Debbie Wasserman Schultz has been biased against Bernie Sanders, like how she corroborated with the Hillary Clinton campaign from the very beginning to rig the debate schedule, or how she cut off his access to Van. There's a rumor that some Bernie Sanders supporters are actually calling her Debbie do anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz. I don't know who's doing this or perpetuating this name, but... It's something I hear. So now he continues by saying, Taken together, these incidents underscore the bottom line that Wasserman Schultz has squandered the most important asset a DNC chair must have. Trust. She has abused the trust of the campaigns and is a significant contributor to the feeling among many Sanders supporters whom we need in November to defeat Trump that the DNC has not played fair. And because a leader reflects on her colleagues, her behavior has also tarred over very good DNC activists and leaders. We can't wait to make this change. We need a strong and fair DNC leader who will put the party in the best position to defeat Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Mr. President, make the call. Now, he also goes on to discuss how under her leadership, the Democrats have lost many seats in the House. They've lost the Senate. She failed at doing the one job she had, helping Democrats win. So that's another reason why she should be unseated. So now the points he raises are fair, but uh, the author, Jonathan Tassini, he actually is a very strong Bernie Sanders supporter. But I'm just surprised that CNN, otherwise known as the Clinton News Network, would even publish this op-ed. So this begs the question. Is it the case that Debbie do anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz is being scapegoated? Because we know all of this unrest, well, it's not going to bode well for Hillary Clinton in November. So why would CNN, the Clinton News Network, who their parent company, Time Warner, is one of Hillary Clinton's biggest contributors, why would they do anything to jeopardize the DNC chair right now when she actually is helping Hillary Clinton? Well, maybe it's the case that Hillary Clinton will throw Debbie do anything for Hillary under the bus as kind of a peace offering uh, because of all this. Who knows? Maybe this is an alarm that shit's going to hit the fan. Who knows? Now, here's what many people don't know. So in 2013, President Obama actually did try to remove Debbie Wasserman Schultz, but she fought back tooth and nail and she actually accused him 
of doing it for misogynistic and anti-Semitic reasons. So Politico explains when she sensed Obama was considering replacing her as chair in 2013, she began to line up supporters to suggest the move was both anti-woman and anti-Semitic. Under fire last fall for her leadership, she took Obama's decision to not remove her then as evidence of renewed strength and said she was confident no one could get her out of the DNC before her term is over at the beginning of 2017. According to sources who've spoken with her, she's also been known to joke around the office about how having a vacation home in New Hampshire might one day be helpful in a presidential run. So the way in which Debbie Wasserman Schultz used identity politics against President Obama in 2013 is the same way we're seeing Hillary Clinton use identity politics against Bernie Sanders. So this is another portion of evidence that suggests that the DNC chair is really doing a lot to push certain narratives like the Bernie Bro myth and whatnot, that Bernie Sanders supporters support Bernie Sanders over Hillary for sexist reasons. But we know that's not true. And just the fact that she tried to use that against Barack Obama when she had no evidence of it, it just shows her true character. And look, she's already displayed her true colors. But this just gives us further evidence that Debbie do anything for Hillary really is an immoral, corrupt person. And let me just say this about her joke about running for president. Please don't. Debbie, really, don't put us through that, okay? Look, we already have to worry that if Hillary Clinton is the nominee, we have to worry about Chelsea running in the future and then her husband. I don't want to have to worry about you as well. Can we just get all these corporatist Democrats to retire? You guys are all millionaires, you have money, you can go work and become a lobbyist when you get out of office. Can you please just leave us alone? Leave the Democratic Party. Let the Democratic Party be taken back by actual sane progressives like Bernie Sanders who want to move the party in the direction that we all want him to move it in. Bernie Sanders' policies, by and large, resonates mostly with the Democratic base. Case in point, he wants universal health care, 81% of Democratic voters now support a single-payer system. Hillary Clinton is against that. So the true heart and soul of the Democratic Party lies with Bernie Sanders. So, Debbie, please don't run for president. Don't put us through that again, because I don't want to have to fight you tooth and nail like we're fighting Hillary Clinton. Please, we don't need your corruption. Just step down. Bernie Sanders surrogate Nina Turner was on MSNBC to discuss the DNC's response to Bernie Sanders' response to the chaos that broke out at the Nevada convention. And so the DNC chair said that she didn't like the tone of Bernie Sanders' campaign. And when asked about this and her response to Bernie Sanders' tone, this is what Nina Turner had to say to the DNC chair. I'm a little miffed. I really can't understand her tone towards Senator Sanders. And I know the chairwoman, so I don't know what's going on. There is a tension building. People are not going to just sit back and accept business as usual. And the same Sanders supporters that she now wants to condemn, lumping all of Senator Sanders supporters into one bunch, is not very helpful if Secretary Clinton is the nominee. Those will be the same voters that they will be begging to vote in the general election. So we gotta come to grips here and come together here on tone all the way around. So I am so glad that she said that because I've been saying this all election. The people who the DNC chair is now disenfranchising and vilifying are the same people who she is going to expect to come out and vote for the Democratic Party in November. See, what she doesn't realize is that even if only a fraction of the Bernie or Bus crowd actually don't vote for Hillary Clinton and they write in Bernie or vote for Jill Stein, that would be detrimental to Hillary Clinton's campaign. If you want to get Hillary Clinton into the White House, if she is the nominee, then we're your ticket. But at every turn, you and Hillary Clinton have done everything that you can to slander us and piss us off and ignore us. The DNC chair, Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz, has proven that she doesn't even think about the actions that she does because she actually admitted that she would love to exclude independents from the primary process because she doesn't think that independents should participate in Democrat processes. So let me get this straight. She wants to exclude independents and then turn around and ask them for their votes in November for Hillary Clinton? Unbelievable. The DNC chair, Hillary Clinton, and the collective Democratic Party establishment has done any and everything to show us that they don't give a damn about us. At every single turn, you guys have given us the middle finger. When Hillary Clinton was asked to make a pitch to Bernie Sanders supporters, all she had to say was, I'm winning. They have no choice but to vote for me. And instead of courting us, she decided to court Bush donors. See, if you turn on us now, we're going to turn on you in November. And you've sucked at getting Democrats into office, Debbie, because throughout your tenure as DNC chair, 
all across the country in state legislatures, Democrats have lost seats. In Congress, they lost House seats and they lost the Senate and they may lose the White House because of you. So you've proven that the one job you have, you suck at and you don't care that you are pissing off and disenfranchising Bernie Sanders supporters who you desperately need. Again, you're not going to win without the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. That is Bernie Sanders supporters. So I suggest that you fall in line and actually do your best to court us over. So Nina Turner just gave you a reality check and you should be thanking her because it's obvious, but apparently you and Hillary Clinton and all of your other corporate establishment buddies didn't realize it, that if you condemn people who you need, they might not come out for you in November. And let me just ask you this, how do you expect to win without us in November? See, Donald Trump pulls in a lot of independents. Hillary Clinton pulls in barely any. If Hillary Clinton was able to pull in the youth vote or get votes from independents and didn't have favorabilities that weren't historically low or wasn't polling even with Donald Trump in some national polls or wasn't being investigated by the FBI, I'd say, you know what? You could probably win without us. But the fact that all of this uh, is true and it's the reality, you need us more than ever. In fact, you need us more than we need you. So if you expect to continue to vilify us and treat us like garbage and abuse us and then come out and vote for you, you are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Now, here's the thing. Even if you immediately reverse course and come out and apologize to Bernie Sanders supporters and actively try to court them and have Hillary Clinton adopt some of Bernie Sanders' progressive policies, it's too late for you. The damage is already done. And... At this point, I don't know how you will win in November, how you're going to recuperate from this. It seems impossible. You've pissed off a very strong, vocal, activist wing of the Democratic Party who you need. And you don't even care. You think that you can win without us. This arrogance is absolutely disgusting. It's part of why we dislike you. So I would suggest that you stop trying to disenfranchise us, stop trying to vilify us, stop trying to piss us off. Because every single day, less and less people are wanting to vote for Hillary Clinton and more and more people are saying that they're Bernie or bust. And I've talked to many people on Twitter who said they weren't actually Bernie or bust until such and such happened. For example, the van scandal, many people switched. And now the Nevada Democratic Convention, many more people switched. So if you really think that we're gonna fall in line come November, you're in for a rude awakening. In an interview with Chris Cuomo on CNN, otherwise known as the Clinton News Network, Hillary Clinton decided to put her arrogance on full display for seemingly no reason. Take a look. So you get into the general election if you're the nominee for your party. I will be the nominee for my party, Chris. That, well, that, is, that is already done, in effect. There is no way that uh, I won't be. I have uh, every confidence we're going to be unified. I, I understand. Where does that confidence come from? Well, in part from my own experience. You know, I went all the way to the end against then-Senator Obama. I won nine out of the last 12 contests. Back in 08, I won Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia. Uh, so I know the intense feelings that uh, arise, particularly among your supporters, as you go toward the end. But we both were following the same rules, just as both Senator Sanders and I are following the same rules. And I'm three million votes ahead of him, and I have an insurmountable lead in pledged delegates, and I am confident that just as I did with Senator Obama, where I said, you know what, it was really close, much closer, much closer than it is between me and Senator Sanders right now. Votes I said, wise. Yeah, I, vote wise and delegate wise. I said, uh, you know, in fact, if you depend on how you evaluated it, I had more popular vote, but I had fewer delegates. And the name of the game is how many delegates you have, right? So when I came out and uh, withdrew and endorsed Senator Obama, about 40%, according to polls, about 40% of my supporters said they would never support him. So I worked really hard to make the case, as I'm sure Senator Sanders will, that whatever differences we might have they pale in comparison to the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. Name an issue you care about, domestic or international, and clearly we are much closer, Senator Sanders supporters and mine, than either of us is with Donald Trump. So literally, when he was asking you a question, you have to cut him off mid-sentence so that way you can say, no, 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 I'm winning. There's no way I won't be the nominee. I will be the nominee. You cut him off just to brag? 
Who does that? You couldn't have just answered the question? Why would you want to rub salt in the wounds of Bernie Sanders supporters? And by saying that, isn't that disrespectful to your opponent, Bernie Sanders, who's still very much in the race? I'm not even sure that she actually realizes that her attitude is off-putting. And the problem is that even moments later, she decided to talk about how she's inevitably going to unify the party. <laughs> I, I can't help but laugh. I've never seen this before. She is running such a bad campaign. See, here's the problem with your argument, Hillary Clinton. See, you can't unify the party because rather than actually trying to court Bernie Sanders supporters, the only pitch that you've made to us is, well, I'm winning and they have no other choice, so they have to vote for me because of course they don't want a Republican to win, right? And meanwhile, you are now courting Bush's donors. So rather than adopting some of Bernie Sanders' platform and trying to court us and being nicer to Bernie Sanders, You've been incredibly condescending. You've done everything to push us even further and further away. So if you're really sure that you're going to win, wouldn't you want to get us on board? Because newsflash, you're not going to win without us. See, you can't get the youth vote. You can't get independent. So if Bernie Sanders supporters, even if a fraction of the people who say they're burning your bus, really don't vote for you in November, guess what happens? You go down. And even as she was talking about party unity, she couldn't help herself. She had to brag some more. Well, I'm three million votes ahead of him. I have an insurmountable lead in pledged delegates. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. And then finally, she says, the differences between me and Bernie pale in comparison to the Republican Party. Name an issue you care about, and me and him are much closer. Well... Hillary Clinton loves to dole out these challenges, and I am always more than willing to accept them. So Hillary Clinton, I accept your challenge. I present you an issue. Free trade. So when it comes to the issue of free trade, who's closer to Bernie Sanders? Is it Donald Trump or is it Hillary Clinton? Well, it's Donald Trump because Donald Trump is actually to the left of Hillary Clinton when it comes to free trade. He does not support these disastrous free trade policies. At least he says he doesn't even though he benefits from them. But here's one example. Another issue, the Syrian no-fly zone. You're in favor of that but Republicans like Rand Paul are against it. And also on the subject of Rand Paul, he's against NSA spying. You voted for the Patriot Act. So I don't think that this argument necessarily holds weight. And this is because Hillary Clinton is a socially liberal Republican. See, she is socially liberal. I'm not going to deny that. At least she says she is. And she certainly pays lip service to social issues, even though I don't think she actually cares about them. But she's a socially liberal Republican. But when it comes to economics... She's a neoliberal. When it comes to foreign policy, she's a neoconservative. So you get the same exact policies as Republicans with Hillary Clinton, with the exception of social policy. So all you can hope for is that she will appoint a Supreme Court justice that will help further social causes and social justice movements. But we can't even expect that with Hillary now because she said that she wouldn't ask Barack Obama to withdraw his nomination of Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland is a conservative. So with Hillary Clinton, if we can't even get a liberal Supreme Court justice, the difference between you and the Republicans is a very, very blurred line now. It's almost indistinguishable. So now Bernie Sanders saw her arrogance and he decided to release a response. So his campaign states, in the past three weeks, voters in Indiana, West Virginia, and Oregon respectfully disagreed with Secretary Clinton. We expect voters in the remaining eight contests will also disagree, with almost every national and state poll showing Senator Sanders doing much, much better than Secretary Clinton against Donald Trump. It is clear that millions of Americans have growing doubts about the Clinton campaign. And that's absolutely true. She claims to be the nominee. Yet, when it comes to hypothetical matchups between her and Donald Trump, slowly but surely, Donald Trump is catching up to you, Hillary. And you're not doing anything to court Bernie Sanders supporters. You're not doing anything to court independence. You're only running to the right, while Donald Trump is now running to the left on many issues. He attacked you for being trigger happy. I covered that in the last episode. So, yes, we have our doubts about Hillary Clinton. And if you are the nominee... That could very well be a disaster. We could very well get a Donald Trump president. So if you voted for Hillary Clinton, President Trump thanks you. So back in February, when Hillary Clinton's numbers were in the tank in New Hampshire, she and the DNC chair wanted to organize an impromptu debate there so that way she can hopefully help her campaign. Uh, and in order to agree to this, Bernie Sanders said that she would have to debate him once per month going forward. So she did agree to it and they had the debate. So now there is one debate left in California and surprise, surprise, Hillary Clinton is ducking out on it. 
So Washington Times explains, Hillary Clinton is ducking her final debate with Senator Bernard Sanders, brushing off a commitment she made earlier this year to participate in a forum in California ahead of the state's June 7th primary. And analysts say the former first lady is right to do so and could only damage herself in another testy back and forth with the Vermont senator. For her part, Mrs. Clinton seems to think another debate is a waste of time. She declared the Democratic primary over on Thursday, telling CNN that she'll be the party's nominee and training most of her fire on Republican opponent Donald Trump. So the argument is that she has nothing to gain by debating Bernie Sanders at this point in the election. Uh, and that may be right, but you do have something to lose by not debating him. You're proving that you're a phony, that you're a fake, that you are bowing out on a debate because you're afraid of Bernie Sanders. Is he really that scary, Hillary? I mean, you are wanting to go up against Donald Trump but if you can't even go up against a Democratic contender who's still your opponent, how are you going to face Donald Trump and all of his attacks? Because you know he will not be as kind as Bernie Sanders has been to you. So how do you expect to win against Donald Trump? You can't wiggle out of those debates against Donald Trump. You can't do that. You won't have the DNC doing your bidding there. So what are you going to do come November? So Hillary Clinton likes to be cocky and say that this election is over. She's already won. She's the nominee. She's already packing up and getting ready to move into the White House. But what she realizes is that it's still not mathematically impossible for Bernie Sanders to win. If he gets 75% of the vote in California, he would actually pass her in pledged delegates. Now look, that's improbable when you look at actual polling results from California right now, but a debate could swing things in Bernie Sanders' favor, and she's not willing to take a chance there. She is wanting to do any and everything to get Bernie Sanders to drop out, so that way she could start attacking Donald Trump. But I've got news for you, Hillary. Many people haven't gone yet. In fact, there's a lot of people in California. So you don't get to just say that the Democratic primary is over. You still have an opponent. His name is Bernie Sanders, and by saying that you're not going to debate him after agreeing to it, it shows that you're a phony. It shows that you don't take him seriously, that you don't respect him, and that's the same way that you've treated his supporters. So if you are willing to just do this in front of everyone, in front of our noses, and say, you know what, I'm going to go back on my word, what makes you think we should believe all of your promises now? Do you think that we believe that you're going to continue to be against the TPP when you do get into office? Well, of course not, and we already didn't believe you, so you're not going to convince us. But you're proving to people that you're a liar. You said you would debate in California, and now you don't want to debate. So either it's the case that you have this election wrapped up, and nothing that you do or say can harm you anymore, and you're just going to win anyway, or you actually face the music and debate Bernie Sanders like you initially had planned to, because that's what's right. Because California voters deserve to hear the differences between you and Bernie Sanders. You've been so cocky. See, the thing about Hillary Clinton is she thought that she had this wrapped up from the beginning. She did everything she can to rig it. She corroborated with Debbie Do Anything for Hillary, the DNC chair, to rig the debate process so that way it would be on weekends and whatnot. And even when they were setting up debates in other states, she was proposing days, like for example in New York, she was trying to get it during basketball games that were really popular and whatnot. Uh, and Bernie Sanders was rejecting it because he's saying nobody will watch those. And then she'd turn around and say, look, We've proposed multiple dates on the weekend at midnight, not actually, but <laughs> in effect, uh, in, in times when nobody would watch them. And then she is blaming Bernie Sanders, saying he doesn't want to accept the debates. Well, yeah, because you're trying to hide them away. The point of a debate is for the American people to actually see the differences between you. And if nobody's watching the damn debate, what's the point of it? But that's what Hillary Clinton wants. Because again, she has nothing to gain from debating Bernie Sanders. Because the more that people hear her, the less they like her. And the more they hear Bernie Sanders, the more they like him. And when you look at actual national trends, you really see that in action. As more and more people learn about Bernie Sanders' progressive policies... Well, what he says resonates with them, and that really does scare Hillary Clinton. So she may say that it's over, but in actuality, she's afraid because Bernie Sanders could somehow pull this off. And I wouldn't get too cocky, Hillary, because if it is the case that the FBI recommends that you be indicted, well, that is not going to look very good for you. So I wouldn't get too arrogant. Debate Bernie Sanders, not because you think it'll help or hurt you, 
but because it's what you agreed to do. Now, my favorite part is the hypocrisy. So this is what Hillary Clinton said about then-Senator Obama in 2008 when he refused to participate in the last debate they were scheduled to have. So she said, honestly, I mean, I just believe that this is the most important job in the world. It's the toughest job in the world. You should be willing to campaign for every vote. You should be willing to debate anytime, anywhere. I think it's an interesting juxtaposition where we find ourselves. And, you know, I have been willing to do all of that during the entire process. And people have been trying to push me out of this ever since Iowa. Again, this isn't surprising, but it just proves that Hillary Clinton really just doesn't care about us. She really holds Bernie Sanders and his supporters in contempt and doesn't care about the democratic process. Time Magazine recently published a new article about Bernie Sanders supporters that brings back the Bernie bro myth. Now, when I talk about Bernie bros and when I call it a myth, I'm not implying that there isn't a small portion of Bernie Sanders base that is sexist or misogynistic and harasses people online. But what I'm saying is that this is common with every single candidate ever. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Ted Cruz, John Kasich, they all have supporters who are overzealous, who sometimes harass people, and who act in immoral, unethical ways. So when you say Bernie, bro, and you use that term, you're implying that there's a certain uniqueness to Bernie Sanders and his supporters that really make them a special kind of crazy, that they're willing to go gung-ho and attack anyone who goes against Bernie Sanders. But that's not true. See, what the Bernie bro myth does is it demonizes people who want systemic change. It's people who are the working poor, who are fighting for a $15 minimum wage, who are fighting for universal health care because they can't afford the monthly health insurance premiums. These people are passionate because they finally have a candidate who has come along and actually is willing to support them and not any corporation or billionaire. So yeah, they're a little bit excited, but this isn't unique to Bernie Sanders. Every candidate has supporters who are sometimes overzealous. And in fact, there's actually evidence that Bernie Sanders supporters are less aggressive than Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump supporters. So I'll get to that, but first I want to get to this article from Time. So it was published by Time, but written by Sally Cohn. Now, I actually really love Sally Cohn. She actually was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, and she's defended Bernie Sanders on the mainstream media, but the problem is that she's buying into mainstream media myths. She's buying in to the idea that Bernie Sanders supporters are crazy and unique in that they really just hate women. So I'll read to you what she has to say. So the Bernie bros are real. I've been the target of Bernie bros on social media, and when I endorsed Senator Sanders at a Brooklyn rally in front of more than 30,000 people, a not insignificant portion of the audience booed me for praising Clinton in my remarks. It's also too easy to suggest that Sanders supporters are a different kind of angry than Trump's. Are we entirely sure about that? The populist right may be more inclined toward misogyny and xenophobia, but the populist left is not immune from these afflictions. And as I've written before, when you see progressive white men, many of whom enthusiastically supported Barack Obama's candidacy, hate Clinton with every fiber of their being, despite the fact that she's a carbon copy of Obama's ideology, or in fact now running slightly to his left, it's hard to find any other explanation than sexism. Now the main problem and the reason why this author is actually growing disenchanted with Bernie Sanders supporters is because she rationalizes distaste towards Hillary Clinton by using sexism. Because she says that uh, Barack Obama in 2008 is just like Hillary Clinton now. In fact, 2016 Hillary is to the left of Barack Obama. But you see, the problem with that is that we don't believe her. She's taking leftist progressive policy positions to appease the progressive base because Bernie Sanders has taken them. So when she talks about the TPP and saying that she now is against it, we know that she's lying because she once called it the gold standard. We know that she's lying because she's taken campaign contributions from people who back the TPP. So we just don't believe her. And even though she's technically to the left, well, she's not in actuality. And when she gets in office, I'd bet every single dollar I have that she will certainly support the TPP, for example. And furthermore, this notion that Hillary Clinton now is where Barack Obama was in 2008, it's not entirely true. So one, Barack Obama was against the Iraq War. Hillary Clinton voted for it. That can never be erased from her record. And second of all, Barack Obama implied that he would try to get money out of politics because he said that he would not conduct politics like business as usual, meaning he wouldn't allow lobbyists to run his campaign. But as soon as he got in office, 
Well, we found out that that was a lie. Hillary Clinton didn't promise that when she was running. She promised to basically run politics as usual, and we didn't want that. We didn't want the status quo, and we thought that Barack Obama would actually facilitate real change. But we learned that that's not true. So the fact that Hillary Clinton is effectively promising to be Obama's third term, it makes us not excited at all. It's not appealing because that incremental change that Obama brought, and he did do some good things, well, it's no longer something that will be sufficient. We need widespread systemic change. We need to get money out of politics, not just have more transparency. So when Hillary Clinton says that she's going to be like Barack Obama, well, this is troubling. I don't want a third Obama term. See, as soon as he got into office, he appointed Goldman Sachs operatives to his administration. Uh, he decided to do favors for people who donated to his campaign. So for example, the FCC chair donated $800,000 to both of his campaigns. Another example is the ambassador to Norway. Well, this guy donated to Barack Obama's campaign and Obama put him in even though he doesn't know anything about politics in Norway. He doesn't know that they have a monarchy. So this is corruption and we don't like it. We don't want the same thing to happen with Hillary Clinton and that's why we don't trust her. So can you make the case that some of Bernie Sanders supporters are too overzealous, that sometimes they use sexism uh, and xenophobia to attack Hillary Clinton and her supporters? Well, of course, but if you're going to say that, you have to say the same thing about Hillary Clinton. But when you use the term Bernie bro, you buy into the narrative that the DNC and the corporate media is trying to sell you in order to demonize people who want to change the status quo. See, this same card was already played in 2008. There was an article from Salon where it was titled Obama Boys Back Off because apparently all of Obama's supporters were overly zealous and were sexist. But by and large, the overwhelming majority of Bernie Sanders supporters are not sexist. In fact, we didn't even know that Bernie Sanders was going to be running. We all, myself included, were part of the campaign to draft Elizabeth Warren to go up against Hillary Clinton. Also, uh, if Hillary Clinton becomes the nominee and Bernie Sanders is out, I'm voting for Jill Stein. And the last time I checked, Jill Stein was a woman. So it's just a false attack on progressives who are people who are least inclined to actually resort to sexism and xenophobia. Of course, a small portion will do that. And that's wrong. We condemn that. But to say that Bernie Bros is this widespread phenomenon that's happening, it's a lie. See, here's the biggest problem with the Bernie Bro myth. All of the misogyny and the racism and the xenophobia that people claim is happening within Bernie Sanders' base is also happening within Hillary Clinton's base. You can go to BernieBroWho.tumblr.com to see numerous examples of Bernie Sanders supporters being harassed. I've also covered on the podcast how many of my female viewers who support Bernie Sanders have been called every single sexist name you can imagine by Hillary Clinton supporters who say that they're betraying their gender by supporting Bernie over Hillary Clinton. And additionally, a recent survey found that Hillary Clinton supporters are actually more aggressive than Bernie Sanders supporters. So going to that survey, Donald Trump has the most aggressive supporters, obviously, at 57%. Hillary Clinton comes in second with 30%, and Ted Cruz comes in third. So Bernie Sanders has the second least aggressive supporters behind John Kasich, probably because he actually doesn't have any supporters. Uh, and 68% of Bernie Sanders supporters are not that aggressive. So in conclusion, is it the case that there are assholes in every single camp? Of course, nobody can deny that. But when you say Bernie bro, what you're referring to is a term used by the corporate media establishment, by Hillary Clinton operatives who try to demonize and delegitimize Bernie Sanders and his supporters because they're afraid. They're afraid that when that many people come together and mobilize and do grassroots activism, that their passion can facilitate a change in the status quo and they don't like that. So they are doing everything in their power to stop that from happening. So if they have to slander us, if they have to call us racist and sexist, well, then they're going to do it because they want to protect their interests and the interests of their corporate donors. That's what's happening. So when you use the term Bernie bro, you're helping perpetuate a lie by the corporate billionaire class. And that's not acceptable. See, Bernie Sanders supporters have formed a movement and it's not just comprised of white males. It includes straight people, gay people, black people, white people, people of every single color of the rainbow, of every single religion. And we all came together for one purpose. We actually want a real progressive in the White House. We want to get money out of politics. We want universal health care. We want humanistic policies to actually be on the agenda 
in American politics, other than, I don't know, maybe tax cuts to billionaires, maybe war. We don't want that anymore. So I'm sorry that you're mistaking our passion as sexism and misogyny, but I've got news for you. This passion is fighting for the greater good of the country. Okay, I care about Hillary Clinton supporters. I care about everyone in the country. I care about Donald Trump supporters. Hence the reason why I'm a humanist progressive. I want to make sure that we have policies that will save lives. That is not going to war, having universal health care and actually helping the middle class and keep them alive because they're fading away. That's what this movement is about. Bernie Bros is a myth. So please, to the author of um, this article, Sally Cohn, I honestly really am a fan of your work. I enjoy everything that you do. I think you're a great journalist, but you've just been misled here. It's really easy to buy into this narrative because if you hear something over and over and over and over, well, then suddenly it just seems to be true and you just accept it. But this is false. And look, there are people within the Bernie Sanders base, as I've stated, that are overzealous and sexist. I condemn them. I don't condone that. But... This is true in every single camp. So if you're going to focus on Bernie bros, then also focus on Hillary bros and Trump bros and Cruz bros, even if they still exist, because they are more aggressive than Bernie Sanders supporters, by and large, according to the survey and also the evidence. You could read it on the Tumblr page I provided you with. So the Bernie bro myth has got to die because it's not true. And all it does is perpetuate a myth that seeks to demonize people who actually care about policy. Well, that's all I got for you guys. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. If you've made it to this point in the episode, you are a trooper. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your viewership. And I also want to welcome everyone who just recently subscribed to the channel. Uh, thank you guys so much. It's almost summer, so I am really hoping to ramp up the videos in the coming weeks uh, when I actually have more free time from school. So I apologize for being late on many of the topics I discussed today, but I just found them really important and I couldn't pass them up. And I just had to say what was on my mind, especially with the Nevada convention. Uh, so thank you all so much. I will see you all next week.